This term, the Supreme Court will hear its seventh case involving the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. But this case, called California versus Texas, might actually be the Obamacare case to end them all. It involves the individual mandate, the requirement that people purchase health insurance or pay a penalty. If that sounds familiar, it should. In 2010, the court considered the very same mandate and upheld it in a 5-4 decision authored by Chief Justice John Roberts. That decision not only shocked many court watchers, it elicited a vigorous dissent from four justices. And almost as soon as the opinion dropped, people began to ask, was the dissent actually the original majority opinion? Had Chief Justice John Roberts changed his vote at the last minute to save Obamacare? Nearly a decade later, the individual mandate is back before the court this term, and everybody's wondering, what will Chief Justice Roberts do this time around? I'm Anastasia Bowden. And I'm Elizabeth Slattery. And this week on DIST, we're talking about NFIB versus Sibelius. The court's decision is indefensible. I respectfully dissent. Because the majority in this case has not done what a court of law must do, I respectfully dissent. For these reasons and others elaborated in my opinion, I respectfully dissent. We respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I dissent. California versus Texas is the seventh time that the Supreme Court will hear a case about Obamacare in the past nine years. The court has heard a case challenging the employer contraception mandate. We'll hear argument this morning in consolidated cases. Sibelius, Secretary of Health and Human Services versus Hobby Lobby stores. A case challenging the IRS's authority to extend tax credits to federal health insurance exchanges. King versus Burwell. A case challenging the contraception mandate as applied to religious organizations. Zubik versus Burwell. We will hear argument first this morning in Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania. And a case challenging the government's refusal to reimburse insurers for losses suffered due to Obamacare. Maine Community Health Options versus United States. But the very first Obamacare case challenged the requirement that people purchase health insurance or pay a penalty, the so-called individual mandate. We will continue argument this morning, National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius. To understand how on earth the same issue is back before the court again, we have to understand what happened in NFIB versus Sibelius. So let's go back to the genesis of this legal saga, a crowded, echo-filled hallway in the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C., where three conspirators gathered to form the basis of the constitutional challenge to the mandate. I am Randy Barnett. I am the Patrick Hotung Professor of Constitutional Law, and I am the director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. I'm Todd Gaziano. I'm currently the Chief of Legal Policy and Strategic Research at Pacific Legal Foundation. But at the time, the Obamacare law was being considered in Congress. And during the litigation that led up to the first Supreme Court case, I was then the director of the Legal Center at the Heritage Foundation. So full disclosure, Elizabeth and I have a special connection to these guests. At the time of the Obamacare challenge, I worked as research assistant to Professor Barnett, and Elizabeth worked as a research assistant to Todd Gaziano at the Heritage Foundation. And our third conspirator? My name is Josh Blackman. I'm a constitutional law professor at the South Texas College of Law, Houston. I wrote my first book in 2013 about the first case, NFIB versus Sibelius. I wrote another book called Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power, Now, here we are four years later, and I'm working on a third book on Obamacare. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. Not everyone remembers it exactly the same way, but all three tell the same basic story. So, you know, the first few pages of your book start with the infamous meeting in the hallways of the Mayflower where the theory is developed. And I'm wondering if you could kind of just take us back and, and tell us your experience with that and how it all, how that first theory came about. Sure. I think between the three of us, we're at this sort of apprentice stage of the Obamacare Grandmasters. It's very unique. Myself, yourself, and Elizabeth. I was at the time clerking uh, for a district judge in Pennsylvania, but I always made it a point to visit the Federal Society Convention in D.C., During this convention, they have these panels where everyone's watching on the main stage, and those are kind of boring. I I usually don't even watch those. The main event, though, actually occurs in the hallway. There's a grand hallway outside the 
in the Mayflower, where all the people sort of sit and they mingle and they congregate. That's where a lot of the magic happens. And I remember it very well. Todd Gaziano, who was at Heritage at the time, now he's now he's with you. Josh means to say that Todd now works with us at Pacific Legal Foundation. He was just sort of walking around and talking about this new bill, the Affordable Care Act. He was saying, you know, we have to we have to write something. We have to say something. You know, Congress can't make people buy insurance. And I I remember this conversation clear as day. I'm like, Todd, of course they can, right? We're talking about a multi-billion dollar industry, healthcare. Uh, even if it's local decisions, why can't Congress make me buy health insurance? It can help uh, lower the cost in other states. Isn't this clearly protected? And I just graduated law school. What the hell did I know? And Todd's like, no, Josh, you're looking at this the wrong way. You got to write something for your blog. You got to go write something about it. I'm like, Todd, come on. This is, this, is a, this is a loser case. Here's Todd's version. Well, several of us had been following the debate on Obamacare and a short op-ed that appeared in the Wall Street Journal arguing that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. The op-ed he's referring to was written by David Rivkin and Lee Casey, two constitutional attorneys from the firm Baker Hostetler. But back to Todd. The academic response to that op-ed was that it was ridiculous. The more I looked into it, the more convinced I became that the individual mandate was not only not supported by the original public meaning of the Constitution or the text of the Constitution, but also had no support in the Supreme Court's precedents. So that was the sort of thought that I went into the Federal Society National Lawyers Convention in the fall of 2009. And what I wanted to do was to find a high profile author who would co author a lengthy article that would make the case that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. And here's Josh. And then who walks in? Randy Barnett walks by. And yeah, Randy is a bit of a rock star mentality. I don't want to puff his ego up any more than it already is, but he does. He has that persona. Uh, we're good friends, by the way. We're co-authors. And Randy walks in and Todd goes to Randy. You know, Randy, I really want to write something about this Obamacare bill. Todd says he was a little more imploring. I accosted him and uh, I really wanted him to be the lead author uh, for this paper. And Randy then says, I haven't given it much thought. And Todd says, okay, tell you what, come by my office on Monday. This was Thursday or Friday. So come by my office on Monday and we'll talk about it. And Randy says, okay, sure. So basically by the end of the conversation, I had his tentative agreement that he would help write a paper if we had another co-author or two. And he understood that I wanted that produced in, in three to four weeks, that we needed to really act fast. That meeting, um, I dubbed the Mayflower Compact, a little showy, but it was a beginning of a, of a genesis that laid the groundwork. And the rest is history. And I was just a sort of fly on the wall that happened at the right place at the right time. If I'd gone to the bathroom, I would have missed it. Professor Barnett starts the saga a little earlier. The genesis of the illegal challenge started when the Wall Street Journal in September pub published an op-ed as to why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. And um, I was so unpersuaded by that op-ed that I thought, well, if that's the best argument against the mandate, then it must be constitutional. I, I was a member of the blog on Politico called The Arena, and the format was they would ask a question. Um, every morning, and then you'd be able to weigh in on that. And, and so the question they asked one morning was about the Wall Street Journal op-ed from the previous day about the individual insurance mandate. And I got up and I you know, checked my handheld and I saw that that was the question of the day. And I kind of had to decide, you know, decide what I would do about it. And then I read one of the first posts on it, which was by a professor at Washington and Lee who was it was an extremely snarky, nasty post about how any any serious person would think it's constitutional. No serious person would think it was not constitutional, which got under my skin. And then I had to decide whether I was going to post a reply to that. And I decided, OK, what the heck, I would do it. And then I posted a reply that, well, let's start the old fashioned way. Let's just ask what the Constitution says about this. And then it went through uh, basically saying that uh, the Supreme Court hadn't really decided this before. Um, and so there's no particular barrier to it just following the original meaning of the Constitution and deciding that it was beyond the power of Congress to reach. And that was my first foray uh, into the Obamacare challenge. The next time I thought about it was at the Mayflower Hotel. 
uh, when I joined that group that Josh Blackman describes in his book. And Todd Gaziano asked me what I thought of the issue. And then he said, you would like to do something about it. And I said, yeah. He says, well, whatever we do, we've got to do it quickly. Me and that's how it started. Randy, Todd, and Nate Stewart, another attorney in Washington, wrote a legal memorandum entitled Why the Personal Mandate to Buy Health Insurance is Unprecedented and Unconstitutional. And that was released one month after the Mayflower meeting. The Heritage Foundation then had a public event in which we presented the piece in their their little auditorium on the first floor. Um, And it was actually a debate between me and Eugene Volokh. Eugene Volokh argued that the act was constitutional. And I argued that it wasn't. But what was really important was an event that was held immediately after that, which was upstairs at Heritage where there was a lunch for congressional staffers. And the reason why that was important is that I discovered at this time, which is something I didn't know, and that is that senators have the right to make a point of constitutional order, and it's an objection. And if they make such a a point of constitutional order, there must be a debate and vote on the constitutionality of the measure. But Republicans were not planning on making a point of constitutional order because they and their staffs could not think of a constitutional objection to make. So at this briefing, we gave congressional staffers from the House and the Senate, perhaps most importantly from the Senate, our argument and that was in November, late November. And then uh, sometime shortly after that, the bill emerged from the Senate committee. And here's Todd. As Randy and, and others have related, the Senate did argue a constitutional point of order. All of the Republican senators uh, voted to uphold the constitutional point of order, which was that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. The majority then held uh, by the Democrats voted the other way. So the point of order failed, but the rest is history with the launch of the litigation. It certainly gave wind to the sails of those who did argue that it was unconstitutional. As important as that validation of our theory by every Republican senator uh, was the fact that this was put on C-SPAN and then it was picked up by talk radio. And from then on in, everybody had our argument and a lot of, and, and talk radio had our argument. Um, It was sometime uh, after that that I was contacted by Greg Abbott, who was then the attorney general of Texas, now is the governor of Texas. And as attorney general, he wanted to know what it was that he as an attorney general could do. And we discussed options. And it was sometime after that that he and the attorney general from Florida took the lead in filing a lawsuit once the day after the Affordable Care Act was finally passed by the House in March of 2010. So the next day, it was passed on a Sunday. The next day, they dropped their lawsuit, and we were off and running. So uh, Randy's been called the godfather of the Obamacare challenge. How do you feel about that uh, that nickname? And should we call you the Todd father of the Obamacare challenge? Uh, Todd father's fine, but if he's the godfather, then maybe I'm the great godfather or something like that because I did have to twist his arm. He wasn't sure that it was worth all that effort to produce a paper. He wasn't sure that uh, the Senate actually would uh, take up uh, the debate, but I'm happy for my small role. So what was the legal theory that these legal minds cooked up? Previous decisions had held that Congress could prohibit activity uh, under its commerce power. It could prohibit activity that was wholly intrastate under its commerce power, if that was economic and had a substantial effect on interstate commerce, it could even prohibit and regulate activity um, that was not economic if doing so was essential to a broader regulatory scheme. But it had never held um, that Congress could make you engage in commerce or economic activity. So in the Rach case, which as you know, I was the lawyer on behalf of Angel Rach who argued that case in the Supreme Court. In the Rach case, uh, we objected to the prohibition on medical marijuana using marijuana as authorized by state law as being beyond Congress's power to enact. We lost that case. But when we were litigating that case, we never imagined, nobody ever imagined that Congress had the power to make you buy marijuana or make you grow marijuana. It had the power to regulate how you grew it. It had the power to stop you from growing it. But did it have the power to actually make you grow it? And our argument was that so there was no authority that said Congress had that power. That was step one. Step two was this would actually be an improper use of Congress's power and that making people do things 
was substantially more onerous than stopping them from doing things. As bad as it is to stop you from doing something, you still have an infinite variety of other things you can do. But if they can make you do things, there's only 24 hours in a day. And so making you do something is, is fundamentally substantively different, qualitatively different than stopping you from doing something or regulating how you do it. And this manifested itself before oral argument and during in the, in the famous broccoli hypothetical, right? Right. Although I did not originate the broccoli hypothetical. So uh, that is, I'm not to be blamed or credited uh, for the broccoli hypothetical. But yes, just because it can regulate how broccoli is grown or, uh, or, or regulate the food that you buy, it can't make you buy um, and it can't make you eat uh, the food that you buy. Uh, it can't make you eat healthy. It can maybe stop c companies from marketing unhealthy products, but it can't make you buy a healthy product. It can't make you eat one. The plaintiffs argued that if Congress had the authority to regulate your decision not to purchase health insurance and therefore force you to purchase health insurance, it could force you to do pretty much anything because any inactivity in the aggregate affects interstate commerce. Here's Justice Scalia talking about the broccoli hypothetical during the oral argument. But could you define the market? Everybody has to buy food sooner or later. So you define the market as food. Therefore, everybody's in the market. Therefore, you can make people buy broccoli. The government also had a backup theory. It argued that even if the Commerce Clause didn't allow the government to enact a mandate, the mandate was a legitimate use of its taxing power. So what's the problem with that? Well, the first problem is that the mandate looked nothing like a tax. Here's Randy. For one thing, the act says requirement. And then it says enforced by a penalty. It uses the word requirement. It doesn't use the word mandate, by the way, but it does use the word requirement. And then it's enforced by a penalty. And a requirement enforced by the penalty is not a tax. And not only that, but it appeared in a part of the law that dealt with regulation. And it didn't appear in the part of the law that dealt with taxes. There was a whole section of the law that was about taxes. This wasn't in it. So for many statutory construction reasons, it's just an improper reading of the statute to call it a tax. And President Obama had denied that it was a tax when he was accused of, of, of having raised taxes. For us to say that you've got to take a responsibility to get health insurance is absolutely not a tax increase. At one point in our interview, Todd mentioned that he, Randy, and Nate Stewart had added a taxing power argument to their heritage paper, but that it only took up a few pages. Even then, he said... Those few pages were more than the federal government had devoted to the taxing issue in its brief before the Supreme Court. In fact, the government only spent 18 lines defending the mandate as a tax. I asked Todd what he made of all of this. The argument's incredibly weak. It was incredibly weak then. It's incredibly weak now. At the oral argument, at least some of the justices expressed skepticism about this theory as well. Here's Justice Scalia questioning Solicitor General Don Verrilli on this point. You're making two arguments. Number one, it's a tax. And number two, even if it isn't a tax, it's within the taxing power. I'm just addressing the first. What the president said is it a tax or not a tax? The president didn't think of it. The president was. said it wasn't a tax increase because it ought to be understood as an incentive to get people to have insurance. Speaking of the oral argument, there were seven attorneys making arguments spread out over a few days. And there were some real heavy hitters. Paul Clement, Mike Carvin, Greg Katzis, who's now a judge on the D.C. Circuit. And that's just a few of them. Here's Josh Blackman. Usually the court hears an hour of argument, two if it's a really big case. This was three days of argument time. I think it went nearly six hours if memory serves. And then there was this moment from Justice Kennedy. Randy describes it here. I was arguing in my commandeering the people piece um, and on the stump that if this is upheld and treating citizens this way is upheld, uh, that would fundamentally change the relationship of the citizen to the state. It would really make us subjects and not citizens. And during oral argument, Justice Kennedy asked Don Varelli. When you are changing the relation of the individual to the government in this what we can stipulate is, I, I think, a unique way. Do you not have a heavy burden of justification to show authorization under the Constitution? Whoa. When he said that, oh, my God, I'm sitting there in, I'm sitting there listening to him say that. I went, holy smogoli. I was criticized for saying that. And here he's saying it. And the way I, try, I tell this story is, though, back in the old uh, black and white uh, movie days, 
uh, when something newsworthy happened, all the reporters would rush to a bank of telephone in a telephone booth. So there'd like be 10 telephone booths and all the reporters would rush into the telephone booth to file their story. And I said, if there had been a bank of telephone booths, at that point, when Justice Kennedy made that statement, all the reporters would have rushed to the telephone booths to file the story. If they knew what was going on, that's a tell. And Justice Kennedy didn't usually conceal his his opinions that well. So that was a huge tell that he had bought into my theory of the case. What did people think coming out of oral argument? I was emboldened to think that they were going to strike down the individual mandate. I was much less clear whether they were going to sever that provision and strike down the entire statute. But I was pretty convinced that the individual mandate uh, would be struck down. And I appeared in a program saying that it is you know, foolish to predict Supreme Court outcomes, but that I was going to go out on a line and I was going to strongly predict that, that the court was going to come out the right way. Oh, you know, we thought we'd won. Not everyone agreed. I was always pessimistic that challengers would win. Um, and I'm pretty sure I thought Kennedy would be the swing vote. Justice Kennedy always had sorts of comments that cut both ways. And I didn't know which way he was going to cut. I, I missed the chief, though. And, and this is something in hindsight I only recognize. So it was the very end of the Supreme Court's term, and everyone was waiting to find out what would happen. And then the decision dropped. I have the announcement in case number 11393, National Federation of Independent Business versus Sebelius, and the related cases. The Affordable Care Act's requirement that certain taxpayers pay the government for not obtaining health insurance is, in effect, a tax on those without insurance. Passing on the wisdom or fairness of such a tax is not our role. Because the Constitution permits it, we must uphold it. Our decision today is based on our responsibility, recognized in Marbury versus Madison, to say what the law is. It is not in any way based on our judgment about whether the Affordable Care Act is good policy. That judgment is for the people acting through their representatives. It is not our job to save the people from the consequences of their political choices. Everyone seems to remember where they were when the opinion dropped. Um, I was in my office at Georgetown. Well, I was in the uh, courtroom. Oh, I have a good story. It's actually it's a painful story to recount. I was back in the office at Heritage, frantically hitting refresh on SCOTUS blog. We had multiple TVs on with different news channels. CNN and Fox News initially reported the mandate was struck down, but SCOTUS blog reported it was upheld as a tax. We'll All right, John, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Kate Baldwin has got some information. Kate, go ahead. Tell us what's going on. It appears as if the Supreme Court justices have struck down the individual mandate. The individual mandate has been ruled unconstitutional. It was mayhem. It was confusing. News reports were mixed. The Supreme Court's website had crashed. CNN got it wrong. It was just, it was a disaster. Yeah, Fox and CNN both got it wrong. I was in my office at Georgetown uh, on my computer monitoring it on SCOTUS blog. Um, I had several op-eds to write that day. I didn't want to go into court. Uh, I had several op-eds to write. And so I was monitoring it. And my mom texted me, "Um, you won. She was so excited. You won, you won. And I said, no, mom, we lost. And she said, no, but Fox said you won. And I said, no, no, Fox is wrong. And it turns out CNN was also wrong. We lost. The reason was that was they, they read the beginning of the opinion and the beginning of the opinion said the individual insurance mandate is uh, unconstitutional. And wouldn't you think that if you have five votes for your theory that it's unconstitutional, you'd win the case? Well, that's what everybody, that's what they thought. And then they didn't get to the, however, here's where I'm going to get around everything I just said. They didn't read far enough. But SCOTUS blog did. So SCOTUS blog knew and uh, accurately reported it. That's how I knew we lost. I was scheduled to speak at a, at a conference in London. And I'll never forget this. Um, I knew the last day of the term was to be on a Thursday, and my conference was on a Friday. So I could just get a red eye Thursday and get there Friday morning, go straight from the airport to the conference. Or I said, no, let me fly Thursday morning. You know, I can read the opinion on the plane, and that way when I land, I can you know, write about it. There was no Wi-Fi back then. There was no power in planes. This was 2012. We didn't have that. So I bought a ticket for Thursday morning instead of the Friday red eye. I could have, but I, you know, I didn't. That was a mistake. 
as the story goes, I'm at O'Hare in Chicago. We're boarding. And it was around 10 o'clock. I'm like, okay, this is O'Hare. Nothing ever leaves on time ever for anything. I'll get a delay. It'll be fine. And we're moving, we're moving, moving. Everything's on time. And indeed, we actually close the door early. I'm like, oh, crap. Then finally, as we're about to take off, I get a message from my girlfriend who says, the court struck down Obamacare. I'm like, oh, my God. No way. I can't believe that happened. And then, I'm not joking, literally, as we're like almost in the air, my phone's still on, I get this other message saying, no, 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 Robert's wrote to save the mandate as a tax. I'm like, what? And then I had like 11 hours of silence that crossed the pond. Chief Justice Roberts' opinion can be summed up like this. If it kind of looks like a tax and raises revenue like a tax, it doesn't matter that Congress didn't call it a tax. In a joint dissent, Justices Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito argued that because the so-called tax was designed as a penalty for violating the law rather than as a forced contribution to raise revenue, and because Congress itself called the supposed tax a penalty, the mandate was not a tax. According to the dissenters, Chief Justice Roberts had effectively rewritten the statute in order to save it. The dissent added, and on this point, Chief Justice Roberts agreed, that the penalty could not be justified as a use of Congress's commerce power because, quote, if all inactivity affecting commerce is commerce, commerce is everything. Using such reasoning, there would be no limit on the government's ability to compel activity in order to regulate it. Here's Justice Kennedy reading the joint dissent from the bench. Now, despite the fact that Congress exceeded its power to regulate interstate commerce when it passed the individual mandate, a majority of the court holds that the individual mandate, if it's recast as a tax, is is constitutional. The act requires the purchase of health insurance and punishes violation of that mandate with a penalty. But what Congress has called a penalty, the court calls a tax. What Congress called a requirement, the court calls an option. And where Congress mandates that the person shall obtain insurance, the court says he may but need not obtain insurance. In short, the court imposes a tax when Congress deliberately rejected a tax. The fundamental problem with the court's approach to the case is this. It saves a statute Congress did not write. The court regards its strained statutory interpretation as judicial modesty. It is not. It amounts instead to a vast judicial overreaching. It creates a debilitated, inoperable version of health care regulation that Congress did not act and the public does not expect. As the dust settled, clues started emerging that the chief may have changed his vote from striking down the mandate to upholding it. The first clue being one very curious word in the dissent. The dissenting opinion refers to Justice Ginsburg's concurring opinion on the Commerce Clause issue as the dissent. Why were the dissenters calling the concurring opinion a dissent? Unless they had originally been writing as the majority. What do you make of, um, in the dissent, it refers to the concurrence as a dissent? I know some people thought. It actually is. At various points, the Ginsburg opinion is both a major- is both a concurrence and a dissent. And at various points, the Scalia opinion is both a concurrence and a dissent. That's why I say the joint opinion and the, the joint, you know. With respect to the um, Commerce Clause analysis, Ginsburg was in dissent, right? With respect to necessary and proper, Ginsburg was in dissent. Uh, with respect to the Medicaid expansion, Ginsburg was in dissent, okay? Now, with respect to the taxing power, Scalia, Thomas, Leto, and um, Kennedy were in dissent. That's one way of explaining it. But then leaks started springing from the court that Chief Justice Roberts had changed his vote and an even bigger bombshell, maybe the dissent was actually Chief Justice Roberts' original majority opinion. Suddenly, every Supreme Court lawyer in the country transformed into Sherlock Holmes, searching the opinions for clues. There are certain clues you can look for. This is not like, you know, anything solid, but there's like Sherlock Holmes stuff you can do, right? Where, uh, you know, if a dissent has a really long fact pattern, right? Or if a dissent says things in a certain way that seem, that, that, that don't seem like a dissent, or maybe uh, the vote's very fragmented where people don't join different parts, right? There are different clues you can Sherlock Holmes this stuff and figure out that perhaps the majority was a dissent. For example, the dissent includes a lengthy section on severability that's probably unnecessary unless the mandate was going to be struck down. 
Commentators also noted that Justice Ginsburg directed much of her critique at the chief specifically and not the other justices, even though they ruled the same way on the Commerce Clause issue. It's not the sort of thing you would do if you're trying to maintain a fragile majority, but it is the sort of thing you might expect to see if she was writing a dissent. Then there's the sheer length of it. The joint dissent is simply long, even going into depth on points with which it agrees with the chief justice. Why go to such great lengths if you agree? Unless, maybe, that opinion had already been written by the chief justice when he originally drafted a majority striking down the mandate. Uh, There were some other arguments that were made relating to the way the footnotes read that suggested they're not the type of footnotes that you normally find in a dissent. So that, that just adds to the, the plausibility that it started out as a majority opinion. The fact of the joint dissent itself was unusual. It's not totally unheard of. Perhaps the dissenters wanted to show a united front. Some people speculated that Chief Justice Roberts drafted it as the majority before he jumped ship, and then the other four merely repurposed it and drafted the rest from there. But there are other explanations. Here's Paul Clement, who argued part of the case in the Supreme Court. And I think that was just another way for the justices to underscore the the depth of their feeling in dissenting. You know, the obvious way that justices can underscore their sort of feelings in their dissent is, in addition to how they write it, is the traditional opportunity to read a dissent from the bench. But I think all four of those justices joining that dissent was their own kind of unique way of saying, we dissent and we really dissent. Maybe one day in the future when the justices' private papers are released, we'll finally get an answer. But in the meanwhile, we can speculate. Here's Randy Barnett. As for whether the dissent, the conservative dissent was meant to be a majority opinion, I don't really know. But my, from everything I do know, I think there's no reason to disbelieve that Just, Chief Justice Roberts didn't take this ad- opinion to write himself. That is, he was in the majority. I think we know, he fit, we know now he switched his vote. So he was in the majority, and there's no reason to believe he didn't take the opinion to write, to write himself. And it was in the course of writing that opinion that he changed his mind as to what he was going to do. Just to explain... One thing, after the court hears oral arguments, the justices meet and cast preliminary votes. Whomever is the most senior member in the majority gets to assign the vote. So if the chief justice is in the majority at at this preliminary stage, he decides who will write the opinion. Here's more from Josh Blackman. Uh, You know, I wrote my book and I'll I'll rely on what I wrote. I'm, I'm not convinced by that. From what I gathered, Roberts made his decision fairly early on. He decided fairly early on that he was going to do what he did. He, he was perhaps undecided on the taxing power. Um, so perhaps the Scalia-Kennedy opinion was written with the hopes Roberts would come on board. But I don't know if that was ever actually officially a majority that had five. I don't think it ever I don't think it ever actually did. I don't know when RBG's papers are coming out or whenever these papers are come out, but I'll be ready. Uh, whenever Whoever the first is for NFIB, I'll be there with, with hat in hand uh, to figure out what the hell happened. And I'll write me you know, a third edition of my book, who the hell knows. And even though he won't speculate about whether he believes the chief justice changed his vote, here's what Todd had to say. What I can say with more clarity is that if it is true that a justice changes his or her vote to please the public or in light of public pressure, that really would undermine the integrity of the court rather than supporting the integrity of the court. But I can't say in any individual case whether that is, that is so or not. And here's Paul Clement again. You know, respect to that particular case, that's, that's yet another kind of unique category of dissenting opinion, which is to say the one that started as a majority. I, I suppose that's, you know, you can think of that as the saddest kind of dissenting opinion, maybe. But, uh, but you know, there, there certainly are some of those. And, you know, and I do think it's, you know, it's always interesting for court watchers to, you know, sort of, you know, try to find those clues. The saddest type of opinion indeed. I went through all 12 stages of, of loss, I think, in this in a short period. I was, I was angry. I was bitter. I was resentful. I was jealous. I don't know what, what to say. I'm sure there are stages. I went through them all. Uh, I think we all went through those 12 stages of grief, or maybe I think I went through 40 stages of grief. I know people don't believe me, but every year when I teach this case, I still think it's going to come back the other way. I read the first half of class, like, wow, this is good. This is like, oh, come on. And like, I still have this feeling. It's like, it's like 
maybe this time it'll, it'll, it won't, this won't happen. Maybe this time it'll go the right way. I still, to this day, nine years later, I still have this feeling like, like I haven't gotten over it. Um, it's a damnedest thing. So what happened next? Well, John Roberts' reputation took an immediate hit, at least from the right. I think that was a political inflection point within the conservative legal movement. Because up until that point, those of us who favored what's called judicial engagement, uh, whereas an engaged judiciary will invalidate laws when they're unconstitutional, uh, and they will not bend over backwards in, in a restrained faction to restrain themselves to uphold laws. Um, we were the minority in the conservative legal movement, the small minority in the conservative legal movement. The two years that led up to the um, NFIB case, that two years, as the whole country started to learn our theory and as conservatives uniformly thought we were right, which was interesting in itself, um, they felt deep. And then at once oral argument in some sense validated our argument, even if we were going to lose the fact that the Supreme Court had given three days of oral argument to this case and had seemed so sympathetic, validated the legitimacy of what we were saying, they felt really, really deprived of the victory uh, when it didn't come. And then they saw the way that John Roberts got there, which was using judicial restraint. You know, I, I, He says, I have a duty to defer to the statute. He didn't even say a duty to defer to Congress. He said duty to defer to the statute. Well, that's new, um, which gives you an idea of where his head is at. And so I think they thought there's something wrong here. And then I was, we were able to put, jump in and say, yeah, what's wrong here is this judicial restraint thing that you guys have been asking for all these years. But not much happened in terms of Obamacare. It largely stays on the books for nearly a decade, despite multiple subsequent challenges. We'll hear argument this morning in Sibelius, Secretary of Health and Human Services versus Hobby Lobby Stores, King versus Burwell, Zubik versus Burwell, Maine Community Health Options versus United States, Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania. Then something did change the composition of Congress, and along with it, congressional support for the individual mandate. In 2017, Congress set the penalty, I mean the tax, to zero dollars. And naturally, someone filed a new lawsuit. And the person behind the legal theory happened to be a former student of Randy Barnett's. It's like a Kevin Bacon relationship between me and this challenge. Two people and 18 states sued under the theory that the tax is no longer a tax because it doesn't generate any revenue. And now it's an unconstitutional mandate under Congress's commerce power. They further argue the whole thing has to go because the mandate can't be severed from the rest of the law. If it sounds too clever, so far it's the prevailing view. The Fifth Circuit struck down the mandate on the theory that it was no longer a tax and was instead an unconstitutional mandate under the opinion of five justices in NFIB. And now the court has granted certiorari to decide. So what will Chief Justice Roberts do this time? Here's Randy Barnett again. I think the challengers have a good argument that the only way Justice Roberts was able to find it to be a tax is it met the definition of a tax, which is it raised revenue. That was one of the key indicators in the case law before he ruled as to what a tax was. A tax raises revenue. And a measure that doesn't raise revenue can't be called a tax. And if it can't be called a tax, then what is it? Well, then we go back to its natural reading, which is it's a requirement enforced by a penalty. The penalty happens to be zero here, but it's still a requirement, a legal requirement, and therefore it's unconstitutional as it was, as five votes said it was originally. So to me, it seems like their argument is right, but that's not, that's not the end of the case. That's just, that's just the first step of their analysis. Nobody cares if the mandate goes down now because the mandate isn't raise, isn't doing anything. Um, so the issue is whether the mandate's severable or not. And that's really what the case is going to turn on. In order to sever it, they're going to have to play some fancy footwork with severability doctrine to look to a later Congress and its intent to figure out what the intent, whether it's severable or not. And, and that's what people I think are predicting that they will do. They'll do exactly that. And who's going to get bent out of shape about manipulating severability doctrine? I asked Josh Blackman, Will this case be the Obamacare lawsuit to end all Obamacare lawsuits? It's the saga that never ends. Uh, maybe unless unless California versus Texas ends it all, but I don't I don't know how many of us think that's actually going to happen. Not going to happen. My history with Obamacare is I lose every case. <laughs> well, maybe you'll get a fourth book. Whatever happens, I'm willing to bet we'll see another vigorous descent, and we'll leave that for a future episode. 
Thanks for listening to DIST. Please subscribe on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd appreciate your feedback, so send questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes to dist at pacificlegal.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends to check out DIST. Ooh, fun. Uh, okay, ready? California versus... Sorry. <clears throat> it's really amped up there. Okay. Too much? Too much? <laughs> All right, Josh, maybe just to start so we have it in the can, can you uh, introduce yourself and tell us your familiarity, your experience with the Obamacare, the first Obamacare case? What's Obamacare? No, I'm just kidding. Um <laughs> Well, we're going to have to see if we can dig up that video because, as I recall, it was it was pretty entertaining to watch that that man with his cat on a leash. Okay. Even, even, the, even the bloopers are gems. I like it. Like that music where it's like, ah, ah, ah. you know that music? <laughs> what else did they say that's wrong? <laughs> uh, Record it. Blast it all over. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> we're live tweeting this. Um, Sure. Uh, let's see. Which title should I use? I have two awful titles. What are my titles? I have to look at them again. They're Something too long to remember. That's all the time we have, folks. That's all the time we have for this episode. Gotta go. Gotta go.